Welcome to the Consulting Growth Podcast. I'm Professor Joe Omani, a professor of consulting at Cardiff University and an advisor to consultancies that want to grow. If you'd like to find more out about me and access some free resources to help your consultancy grow, do please visit joeomani.com. That's J-O-E-O-M-A-H-O-N-E-Y.com. Okay, welcome back to the Consulting Growth Podcast. I've got the real pleasure today to be joined by Athena Pepez. We're going to be talking around thought leadership and artificial intelligence. And there's it's rarely, uh, it's quite rare that you can get someone who can talk on both of those uh, topics fluently. And Athena's had a fantastic career um, at Accenture and has been uh, involved in thought leadership for uh, quite a few years now, um, both in terms of research for thought leadership and also being a subject matter expert on the on the topic. So, Athena, I'm, I'm over the moon to have you on the podcast. Um, welcome. Thank you, Joe, and I'm over the moon to to be joining you today. So, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, how you got into thought leadership, um, and also, you know, since leaving. Accenture, what you've been doing, and and you know what what your uh, niche is, please. Yeah, sure. So as you can imagine, thought leadership is a, a niche field in itself. So no one leaves university kind of aiming to go into thought leadership. Um, so as many others in this space, uh, I I ended up in it almost by accident. So. I studied economics. That was my training. That's that was my my first the first phase of my career. I worked as an economist in insurance and uh, then in in shipping. So very much kind of demand supply forecasting space. And then the financial crisis uh, hit um, the Great Recession, and I started thinking about the value, I guess, of um, forecasts for, for business and questioning that a bit more. And then I moved on to Accenture, where, as you said, I spent 15 years uh, there working on research for thought leadership projects with the aim of focusing on technology and economic trends and helping organizations think about emerging problems that they might have that they might not have realized they uh, are coming up. So the thought leadership is, maybe we can get into a little bit more about what thought leadership is in a minute. Uh, but, you know, as you asked what my niche is, my niche is uh, kind of a focus on technology and economic uh, topics as, you know, as expected, artificial intelligence is, is hugely important at the moment. And then always approaching that from the angle of thought leadership and also foresight. But foresight is more like a set of tools that can help you develop more creative um, thought leadership. And right now, I work as an independent consultant. I'm the founder of two consultancies. One is strategic foresight consultancy that helps uh, my clients anticipate and reimagine the future and then how they might act differently. And the other is a thought leadership uh, consultancy called Beacon Thought Leadership that I've set up as a partnership with uh, three other co-founders that I've worked with in the past. And I think we were talking the other day, worked out that between us, we have something like nearly 100 years of experience in, in the space of um, thought leadership. And uh, so, yeah, very excited. We're launching that more formally soon and very excited to be doing that. Oh, great. OK, how good. Best of luck. Um, yes, thank you. Let's do what thought leadership is to start. Well, what good thought leadership is, because I think a lot of people think that their their blog or their tweets or their LinkedIn post is is thought leadership. Thinking about the listeners for this podcast, I uh, who who tend to be boutique leaders, um, I guess, with between 20 and 300 or 1,000 people at, at most. Um, what should, th- should thought leadership be for them? And what could it do for them? Excellent question. So as you said, thought leadership is probably one of the most 
misused terms in in business and in, in marketing or misunderstood. It's really about shaping uh, a narrative around a business problem that's backed by evidence, ideally original research, robust research, with the aim of persuading and influencing your audience to act in a different way. So the the kind of three pillars of good thought leadership are new ideas about a business problem, which, uh, you know, a lot of the, the listeners on this podcast will have, right? If they're if they founded a consultancy, it's aimed at solving a, a problem that, that they've identified. The second is original research. That can be quant research, qualitative research. So, for example, depends really much, very much on the kind of problem that you're focused on. But uh, nowadays, with artificial intelligence, there's a lot of new quantitative research uh, that you can do as well. Um, we can come back to that in a minute. And then the third pillar, in addition to new ideas and original research, is persuasion, putting that together in a way that that is memorable, it tells a story and and influences your audience to to take action. So not not necessarily a TikTok video or or a tweet or anything like that, which but there is something to be said about using different um, mediums to get your message out there. So you might have those three components. It might result in a, you know, in a robust kind of lengthy report, but it might also look like an article published in Harvard Business Review or in Forbes Mm -hmm. um, or video content, because we know people consume thought leadership in in very different ways as well. But, you know, if you've got any high quality uh, asset, you know, thinking about that funnel, you know, if people don't know the company and they're, you know, scrolling through LinkedIn, what's the thing, what's the message that's going to cause the right people to stop the scroll? And then, because they're not going to, you know, necessarily pick up the the 10,000 word paper and, and read it. And then thinking about the middle of the funnel and the bottom of the funnel, um, and perhaps even the sales process itself, when you can send bits of thought leadership the people i think that's a really important point yeah i agree because people you know people have different styles some people are quite analytical they really do actually want to see in my experience the the very lengthy you know 100 page report they like getting into the details or they might come across an interesting kind of hook on social media and then follow up with a lengthy report um others just want the high level message and an overview of how it's backed up by research so that's why you need, I guess, a, a suite of different outputs uh, from your thought leadership as well. And if I can come back to the to the question you raised before in terms of what are the, you know, what can thought leadership do for this audience? What might be the benefits of it? I think what important benefit is um, kind of it enables new conversations you know, discussions with potential clients that are perhaps more natural and not necessarily mm. sales focused. You know, it's a very it's a very different starting point sharing with someone an article you've written that's focused on a problem that you've identified for their business and talking to them about the research you've done on the problem and the new perspective you bring on it. And it's very different asking for a sales meeting. Um, yeah. So it can enable new new uh, conversations, engagement with new clients. The second thing is also trust and enabling companies to find a niche as well, um, or at least posi- to, to show what that niche is. The big companies, Fortune 500, they have an established brand. A, a brand. They've got a lot of... Mm you know, a big marketing machine around that. Um, But uh, a medium-sized consultancy or a small-sized consultancy can establish a lot of brand equity through their thought leadership as well. And it can allow them to own the niche that they've identified and, you know, build around that, as long as their thought leadership is obviously aligned with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. My my dad always used to say to me, you know, have, have a perspective. Yeah. 
when you're talking to someone, the trouble with a lot of the AI generated stuff that we're starting to see coming out is that very often it's pretty bland. And and in effect, I always tell my students, you know, but for a marker, you want to see an argument. You want to say, you know, I'm arguing this because of ABC rather than here's a description or here's a list of 20 things that you should think about. And having that perspective, I think, is something boutiques can do better than the large firms because they can afford to piss people off because they're not selling to, you know, the whole of the market. They're selling to the, you know, 100 or so firms that that perhaps chime with them best. And there are a lot of benefits. I, I agree with that. And I think there are a lot of benefits like being able to be very close to the to the clients. Um that you serve, getting them involved in the research uh, that you do to, you know, for your thought leadership as well, which, you, you know, perhaps larger consultancies might not be able to do. They've got different things they can do, but um, I, I definitely agree with that, that there's a having a perspective, backing that with the evidence as to why you have that perspective as well is important and not just sharing a laundry list of, well, here's some stuff I came across and put together in a in a short um, blog, for example. I don't think they still do, but I know that Source Global Research used to do awards for thought leadership. But in terms of, you know, where your work has or your team's work has either won awards or really moved the needle on client engagement, what was the uh, secret formula? What were the three or four things that you got right? Or is it just difficult to tell yeah so source still does those rankings as far as i know yeah that's right and uh i'm not sure who's top at the moment but accenture was uh was number one uh, quite recently and has been for some time in terms of the secret formula i guess the key is to bring original ideas original perspective Innovative research as well. So I mentioned before how there are new things that we can do with um, with research that we couldn't before. So, for example, being able to analyze uh, using natural language processing, analyzing uh, news articles uh, to uh, pick up what's top of mind and how that breaks down across different industries, uh, for instance, or when uh, business executives talk about a certain topic, what's the sentiment around it, for example? What's the feeling? What are the other topics associated with that issue? So that's kind of some of the new research that can be done. Um, so original ideas, differentiated research, and also some call to action, but without it being obviously very sales focused, you want to give a prompt as to, I get your problem, you can think about this differently. Here's how we're thinking about it. Here's a starter for 10 and kind of leave it at that to create a new sales or a new conversation that might then lead to to sales. So those would be the different kind of things that go into the recipe. Before we move on to the AI and tech side of things, which I know, you know, obviously coming from an Accenture background, you've been quite embedded in that for a long time. But before moving on to that, So I'm interested in the type of research and content that your busy boutique leader could get their hands onto that perhaps, you know, they can't if they can't afford to do what Accenture or Deloitte could do. Yeah, that's a a great question. My personal belief is that the kind of time and budget that they might dedicate to thought leadership will obviously differ, but the fundamentals in terms of having a new perspective, creative ways to do research, and then, uh, you know, persuasion, those you can still develop, even with relatively limited resources. I mean, one uh, plug here is obviously that's the kind of thing that we're hoping to help our clients with at Beacon Thought Leadership, right? We appreciate not everyone can build a whole thought leadership machine in-house, but they recognize the value of thought leadership. Mm. Mm. So we can work with whatever resources they have to help them, um, uh, you know, craft and shape their own thought leadership or offer thought leadership as a service. Now, in terms of what can you, you know, do with what you've 
got, I, I mentioned before, right, you've got one-on-one -on -one relationships with your clients. There might be ways to, for instance, conduct interviews and then codify those interviews. You know, there's so many easy ways nowadays to, to, to generate transcripts. You can create new insights from those transcripts, either using generative AI or, you know, with the effort and or the effort of the marketeers or researchers or whoever might be involved in, in this project as well. You can also uh, partner with others as well. I think there's opportunities sometimes to create you know, if you want to be the owner of a niche, you can create a community around this topic. Yep. So you can ask for uh, partners that are also interested in the same business problem and then, you know, share the, the resources around that. I yep. think that's quite common in, in thought leadership. So using new tools, uh, partnering with, with others that share your kind of passion about the business problem you're, you're looking to solve, thinking more creatively about... Uh, access to, to to people and insights that you've got in house. Um, those are some of the the things that you do. It doesn't work for all firms, but I'm quite uh, a fan with a boutique that is big enough to afford it of doing a statement piece. One of the keys to success of growth of of a boutique up to say a hundred people is getting that niche really really tied down. And there's nothing like sort of an annual statement piece, you know, the, the State of the Union address equivalent. Great thing about this is it, that piece can evolve yeah. year after year to emphasize different areas, but also it, it becomes part of the furniture of the firm. And, you know, then you start to build, you know, press releases around it. You start to get into new publications and and that can be such a big asset, especially if a firm, you know, when a buyer's looking at a firm, all firms say, oh, we've got a great brand. But if you do have this statement piece that's based on consistent research and has been going for a few years and really speaks to your brand and what you do, it's such a powerful asset. It absolutely is. And, you know, that needs the thought leadership. We touched on this before. The thought leadership that you develop needs to build uh, on the brand that you're looking to, you know, to to create and and establish. So there needs to be alignment and definitely consistency. It's kind of a it's your own body of thinking that you just build on over time and evolve mm -hmm. as as your research evolves. So absolutely agree. It's not like you do it once and that's the end of it. You know, having that statement piece that you mentioned and then building your thought leadership around that. Mm. is a great anchor for the work that you do yeah let's move on to ai and i realize there's quite a bit of overlap because obviously ai can help us do thought leadership as you said transcribing things analyzing things but also you can do a uh, thought leadership about ai um now i'm obviously specifically interested in in ai in professional services i i just got off a call just before this one and it was a guy from uh, who's based in ethiopia American educated who basically said to me, oh, Joe, you know, we're looking at, um, I, I, I've got this passion and I've got this great idea about transforming business in Africa, but I can't get enough people and can't afford enough people. How do I, you know, use AI to, to, to replicate people? And we had a conversation around that, which is, you know, we're a few years off from that yeah. at the moment you know at the, the way i see it at the moment is you've kind of got task based ai which kind of we're now, we're now on top of you know doing the powerpoint writing this analyzing that the step that we're moving towards is process based generative ai where perhaps it, you know it can do the analysis and write the report and sense check it and there you might have agents you know running the tasks but the third step really is where you have that employee or would have that employee who manages and thinks for themselves and ties things up in the organization. We're nowhere near that final step where you can replace people, well, replace professional services with AI, but you can replace tasks with AI. What are you seeing out there, Athena? What's, um, what's got your interest, both in terms of you know, what you do in terms of you know producing world class thought leadership, but also what you're seeing in the professional services space more generally. Yeah, the hot topic at the moment. 
I think for maybe for the purposes of of what I'm about to say, just to clarify, I think I'll focus on generative AI more specifically because I think that's the kind of real a game changer uh, for for professional services. But I would like to touch on a couple of other emerging, not necessarily emerging fields, but hot fields like causal AI and synthetic data that are that are also um, transforming mm. thought leadership. In terms of generative AI, I think if I reflect more specifically on the impact on thought leadership, it's increased the supply of thought leadership because it's kind of reduced the barriers to entry, you know, democratized access to a lot of things that might have before been the remit of the big uh, professional services firms. You know, we talked about something like transcription, right? It seems relatively low impact, but that can enable you to do multiple interviews that you couldn't before because you would have had to think about the fact that each one would cost you, you know, $200 to type yeah. up or to translate, you know, so uh, and then the time involved. So you might have said, I'll just do 10 interviews, but now you can perhaps do 50 or more. And then you would have needed, say, two or three researchers to analyze those. Now you don't. You could do that with one. So it can actually, even small um, things like that can have quite a big impact when you look at it across the whole journey of, of thought leadership. On the other hand, I think it's also increasing the demand for really high-end thought leadership because in a world where we're flooded with content, you know, you need a thought partner even more, someone to help you make sense of what's being talked about out there. It's um, affecting both the, the kind of demand and supply dynamics of, of thought leadership. It's also changing the skills required. You know, you need to see AI and generative AI more specifically as a co-pilot, someone that can help you. As you said, we're a long time, I think, from, you know, general artificial intelligence where they can fully uh, replicate exactly what a person does. But we can think about tasks that would be quite laborious, boring. How can they be taken away uh, or use generative AI instead? so that people can focus on the stuff that's more fun or collaborating or brainstorming together about new ideas, for example. One of the limitations with B2B research is that a lot of the outcomes can, it's very hard to disentangle correlation with causation, right? Sure. So uh, a company mm-hmm. that has certain innovation capabilities or does well in certain innovation metrics might also have really good profitability, but you don't necessarily know that one leads to the other. So the promise of causal AI is that it can ask what if scenarios and it can actually help you get around those those research gaps. And there are a lot of companies out there that can help you do that. You know, data, the the kind of uh, cornerstone of of all AI, that can also uh, be a limiting factor. We talked before about what, you know, how can you um, make the most of what you've got? Um, Before, you'd have to, for instance, do thousands of, survey thousands of executives, for instance, or you'd need to pay quite a lot to get a niche survey firm to look into a particular area that was really difficult or a cohort of people that was really difficult to survey. Mm. Now there's synthetic data. There's companies like Hazy AI, for instance, that can generate data sources for you that have the properties of the data that you need without you going out and carrying out expensive field work. So again, I think that's a a good example of how access to to different types of research is being democratized. So I have a very good friend in the NHS who uses synthetic data to mirror. Um, this is for confidentiality issues, obviously. He's, oh. he's sitting on top of yeah. all of the data that anyone's ever used, you know, uh, cap- being captured in the NHS. Now, um, there's obviously remarkable insights that can come from this. And so he's building, in effect, a synthetic uh, layer on top of that data uh-huh. that allows him to, or allows third parties even, to do quite sophisticated interrogation without <clears throat> without accessing the real data of the people behind mm. it. 
If I wanted to use synthetic data to help me understand that, do you have any idea how I would go about that? So I'm asking from a position of complete ignorance here, perhaps actually quite interested in looking into it from a research perspective. Yeah, I think um, the kind of two uh, examples where synthetic data can be quite powerful is A, kind of creating a larger sample size. So it could be that um, if you can create a small um, data base of some of the insights that you have, then you can uh, use synthetic uh, data to create a larger sample size that enables okay. you to more bigger insights. So that might be one way that you it could apply to, to your situation. And then the other is the NHS example that you mentioned where for confidentiality purposes or in other cases where um, you need to protect the data of the of the companies and the people being surveyed, then you would add the synthetic layer on top of that. At an organizational level, that might be, for instance, on issues around, say, inclusion and diversity or sensitive topics that, that it might be difficult to survey uh, your employees on. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, and you might use synthetic data to to do that. Uh, in terms of like how exactly you would get started and all of that stuff, I think that's where sure uh, you know synthetic uh, data expert company would come in. How prepared do business owners need to be for rapid development and adoption of AI technology? Um, and also, I guess, how disruptive do you think it will be, especially to professional services? And the way I like to think about the the future of um, of AI is actually inspired by one of uh, one of the economists I've been following on this called Anton Koronek, and he talks about the fact that the challenge is is we simultaneously overestimate and underestimate what AI can do. So we overestimate what it can do and therefore we expect it to be further along than it than it is. And of course it is improving super fast. But you know, I'm sure every one of your listeners will have had this experience of using just a basic chatbot on a, you know, I, I use mine, I think, on booking.com recently. And it just gives you completely random uh, results. And you think, oh, but I expect today AI to be more sophisticated yeah. and advanced in this. So, you know, I think what we hear in the in the kind of media and the whole hype that's kind of around it, and of course, a lot of investment going into this space, the, there's a gap with kind of our everyday reality still. On the other hand, you have people that underestimate what it can do and kind of dismiss it. And again, that's not beneficial because for the same reason, it is advancing incredibly fast there's a lot of research, a lot of R&D behind it. I think the, the artificial intelligence field will only uh, accelerate. One of my kind of interests is also in humanoid robotics. Um, I think that so far, robotics has been very much about it being used in industrial settings. Uh, because they perform very well in rigid, fixed environments. But there's a lot of researchers now um, embedding LLMs, large language models, into robotics. So you've got companies mm. like Figure AI and Sanctuary AI that are really kind of breaking the limits of what was possible with, with robotics. And as a result, we're going to start seeing them in more everyday settings. In terms of how prepared organizations are, I would say there's like a real huge gap between the top performers, the ones that are like, you know, paying a lot of attention to this, mm. really investing into it, and then the rest. Yeah. Um, and maybe this is kind of inspired by, by my economist perspective here as well. But we know from past experience that it does take a long time for technology to become commonplace uh, across the whole economy, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of what we hear is from large organizations, but small and medium-sized enterprises are still trying to make sense of what it means for them. What are the proofs of concept? 
how can they use it? Uh, about a month ago, I was chairing a conference on the impact of generative AI on knowledge management and insights professionals. And the key theme that came up there was that um, there is a, a kind of huge expectations gap because people expect that they have to be doing something on AI. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they just look for, well, what can I use AI? But really, what they should be doing is thinking, what are my problems? What are my pain yeah. points? Yeah. And where would AI be a good fit for that Yes. Um, for, for that problem? Rather than, well, we must just use AI because that's the hot topic of the moment. Compared to your standard automation, because AI has progressed so fast, very often its application could be quite surprising. And so when I always think when you get transform genuinely transformative technology, the person who knows the business isn't necessarily going to be capable, shouldn't even be capable of knowing where they could be disrupted most. And it reminds me of the business process re-engineering transformation, mm -hmm. where, <clears throat> you know, I, th I think it was Kodak. They did the traditional business strategy approach of saying, well, how can we make film cameras far? Despite having invented digital cameras, they did the traditional approach of, well, how can we make film cameras better, faster, cheaper? Instead of going, oh, actually, that model is dead in the water. And I just wonder if there's companies out there that can't, and I guess this is where you can help them, you know, struggle to think out of the box to that extent. You know, I think project management might be a sort of low level project management program, program office stuff could be an example of that, where perhaps in three years time, that doesn't exist as a, a, a as a consulting service, because AI develops the point that it can do it. And I, I just don't know if it's like the frog in boiling water. I don't know if owners of firms or the bosses of firms who have been through that traditional process are necessarily best placed to think about what it can do for them. I don't know. Yeah, and I think um, I, I get the point around whether they're the ones best placed to kind of imagine the possibilities. Um, I would add two things that I mentioned just now about the, the conference and that one of the key top, um a kind of uh, themes that came out was this, let's not just use AI for the sake of it, let's think about the, the pain points. What's interesting is that that was very much, you know, that the audience for that was professionals, business execs drawn from different fields, so law, private equity, consulting, banking. Just yesterday, I came across a report by the RAND Corporation, and what oh, yeah. they did was they interviewed 65 experts on artificial intelligence and machine learning. So they took the other approach of, we hear this from business executives. We want to know what the AI, AI experts are saying that have been involved in AI project implementation. What are they seeing as the key challenges and barriers and what success factors are coming from this? And it was a key theme in that report as well. I'll share it with you if it's if it's of interest. Yeah, it's great. Really Thank you. Yeah. So that was a key th theme there as well. That you know, when you just kind of are looking to to plug it in anywhere, then you haven't really properly thought about what kind of impact are you looking for. Is that the right fit? And then the risk is that the project fails so to speak mm. it doesn't get the outcomes that that you want and then you become disillusioned with ai because you think well i tried it then it didn't work so mm. there's no potential where in fact there is a lot of potential you just didn't apply it to the right um you know context for your organization the right use case for your organization so i think that's the point around making sure that you focus it on solving problems now in terms of you know, innovation and thinking outside the, the box, that's where uh, foresight, strategic foresight tools can help because they try and get, um, you know, individuals, teams, organizations to not only be thinking about how do I innovate for today, but yep. how do I innovate or create business products <clears throat> for five years, 10 years, 
well, 10 years, who knows, but, you know, three to five years from now, uh, because the mindset that you need is very different. And it's really hard for all of us to break out of that, you know, what's happening today uh, of today's bubble and really think more creatively about what's coming. I mean, three years ago, would we be sitting here talking about synthetic and causal AI and how it's transforming thought leadership? It, it was an emerging trend. I just think sometimes people underestimate what um, what is coming and it's hard to, to mm. kind of anticipate those things. Just one more thing to add on AI, which is that it's a lot easier to think about how it can change existing processes rather than help reimagine, you know, yeah. all of what you can do. I talked about this in the context of research before, right, that uh, we can think about how we can save time on things like that we do already, like the interviews, for instance. We've been doing interviews for a long time. It's very easy to think about how we can save you time and effort on interviews. But there's also a bit around, well, what kind of data sets do I have or do I have access to, not necessarily my own, that are becoming publicly available, that I could analyze using different types of chat, uh, different types of GPTs to have new insights, that is a lot harder. So, and, and yeah. that is, I think, where a lot more investment will, and effort um, will go into uh, as AI progresses. That's the next focus. Yes. Yeah, and of course, the thing, you know, this is what Papa said, the thing is about the future is that it's impossible, you know, it's impossible to know because we're dependent. Knowledge depends on new technology being invented and it's unpredictable consequences. So interesting times ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. Athena, thanks so much for your time. Really, really appreciate your, your expertise. We'll we'll put a a couple of links um in the in the show notes to your uh your companies, Beacon and your personal website, and hope to keep in touch with you. Thank you very much, Joe. Pleasure to join you today. Thank you.